I was tasked for a school project to make an artificial intelligence able to beat the game Ludo. The rule for this task was fairly easy. Make an artificial intelligence able to beat the game as best possible using some of the artificial intelligence methods we had learned about in class. However, as it turns out, when making an artificial intelligence like this, are there many pitfalls you can fall into? So, let me explain you how I did it. There are many different ways of solving this task, but the one I ended up using was evolutionary learning through the genetic algorithm. The genetic algorithm is based on the idea of survival of the fittest. If you have an environment where certain genes lead to a higher survival rate, those genes are more likely to pass on. And we want to mimic this behavior using artificial intelligence. The way we mimic it is by changing what fit mean. So when we say survival of the fittest, normally that is survival rate. Are you more likely to survive in any given environment? But instead, we can say that the more fit ones are the ones that can run longer, can stand longer, or can win more in Ludo. These ones we then use as parents for the next generation, and through evolution, by repeating this enough times, we should see that we change to have the genes that we desire, which is referred to as a fitness function. So, how did I actually do this? My idea was to use a neural network, and through evolutionary learning, find the weights that would be needed to make a good Ludo player. So first of all, we need to figure out how is the neural network gonna look. <laughs> and to figure this out, we need to take a look at the game. We have four players in the game, and each player, in a best case scenario, can choose one of four actions. They can choose either to move piece one, two, three, or four, if all four pieces are on the board. However, this is not always the case. There might be two pieces on the board, or even one. Meaning we can't reliably choose an action knowing it will actually be available. Therefore, chose I to only have one output in the neural network. My idea was to use the neural network as sort of an evaluation function that would tell how good it is to move a certain piece. So what my player would do is that it went through all the pieces that are currently available on the board slap all the information it knows through the neural network, and then the neural network would give it a value from zero to one. One meaning very, very good. This is absolutely the best move you can do, or zero meaning not very good. And then it would take the highest that is available. With this, is there no problem of accidentally choosing an action that isn't available or more difficult training? And it also means that how a network needs to look can be simplified a lot. Even though it would be really great, is it not possible to use the entire information of the board? There's simply too many possible states, too much information. So we need to simplify this somehow. I chose to change it to eight inputs. Whether or not, with the current dice, the piece we're looking at can attack an enemy, whether or not it can escape an enemy if the enemy is within six spots of the other one and are able to attack, whether or not the piece is safe by, for example, being in the start or being in the end area. If a piece is able to reach safety, if it can be attacked, if it is within six spots of the other one, if it can reach a star, giving it a boost, given the current dice, or if the next move is dangerous, if it moves forward and ends in front of another piece, meaning another piece can attack it, that would not be great. And lastly, if it is home, because if that one is high, we want the network to realize, oh, we should definitely not <laughs> look at this one. With all of this, do we now know that we have eight inputs to the neural network and one output? And we can already now say that the neural network will probably be fairly small because the information can be somewhat easily interpreted. If, for example, the piece have an opportunity to escape an enemy that is attacking, yeah, we just likely just want that multiplied with something very high, right? And the same can be seen for other pieces. So we don't need the network to be that complex. I chose to go with yeah the input input layer of eight neurons, two hidden layers of eight neurons, and the output layer of one neuron, plus bias. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to refer to the neural network of the artificial intelligence as its brain. And our goal now is to find the best weights and biases for this neural network to complete the task. And to do that through the genetic algorithm, do we use what's called value encoding? Because we're interested in whole values, that will work for the neural network. The weights and biases are going to be referred to as the chromosome. And that is what we are interested in finding. We're going to combine and mutate and so on to this chromosome to find the absolute best weights and biases we can to complete this task. So now let's go through the steps of actually doing this. The first thing I did was generate a population. In this case, meaning 64 individuals or artificial intelligences that are going to play Ludo with the neural network as their brain. And they all were created with random chromosomes filled with random values varying from minus one to one. I then put all of them in groups of four to play against each other and try and win as much as possible, with the idea being that the more they win, the better a chromosome they must have, the better genes they must have. The reason for putting them in groups of four is that if I just have them play against opponents that play randomly, then I imagine we would see a ceiling to what they're capable of doing. As the AIs get better and better through evolution, should you also see it becoming more and more difficult for them to win against each other. Therefore, you should also see that the ones that win are better and better and better. In theory. <laughs> but another issue is how to evaluate how good they are. If they only play 10 games against each other, then they could just have won by chance. Ludo is a fairly random game, so they need to play a lot in order to remove this randomness. However, if you just crank the games up to 1000 or 100,000 or whatever, then you will see that it will take a lot of time to go through this evaluation step. And it's already going to take a long time, you have a lot of generations to get through. So you need to find a balance here. For me, it seemed that 300 games seemed to strike the balance pretty well in terms of how good they actually were and speed. Next up, we need to select the individuals to go on. And I do this in a couple of different ways. One of them is elitism selection. I take the best player that we have seen and make that one fill up 25% of the new children that is going to be created, a copy of that one. This is to ensure that even in the worst case that some randomness leads to the children being worse than their parents, then the good genes are still present in the new children. I also make another 25% again from the best player. However, this player will experience mutations. So there will be some randomness added to it. The last 50% is done through roulette wheel selection where we make a roulette wheel that we use to select the parents for the, new, for the new children. The way the roulette wheel works is that you take all of the win weights and normalize them based on the total win rate, and then you choose a random one in it. What you should see is that if one of them wins significantly more than the other one, then you will see that it should more likely get chosen. However, there's still a chance that the ones that do not perform as well get chosen, and that is to ensure variation, because it might be that one of them is performing really well, but it could be that some of the genes that we desire are in the one that looks bad. So we add some variation through this. And 25% 20, uh, of the 50% added through the roulette wheel will experience mutations as well. For the reproduction stage, I've already told most that is needed to be known, but for the children that have experienced mutation, I've chosen that for all of the genes that are in the chromosome, there's a 10% chance that they will experience mutation. And that if it happens, then the value will vary from between minus 0.3 and plus 0.3. That will be added on top of the val current value it already has. And for all the 50% created with the roulette wheel, they will be created by having two parents. And there I use single point crossover. I'm literally taking one chromosome from one chopping it mid over and combining with one from another chopping mid over so it gets the first half and the second half smashed together and then we reach the criteria stage where we can make a certain criteria form 
if the program should stop or we should try and create new children again. And that criteria could, for example, be if it has a high enough win rate or what I did is enough if enough generation has passed. So all we've gone through now is a generation. And for example, I set 75 generations for mine. And then you can see how good it is. One last thing to cover is how to tell if one generation is better than another. So, so far for creating the children, we are viewing the win rate when they're playing against each other. However, when we need to know if generation 50 is better than generation 10, this method won't exactly work. As in the first generation, we might see one AI performing 20% better than another AI. But when we get to the 70th generation, we might see one that is only 1% better. But 1% better could really matter at, uh, at 70th generation, because you would assume that most of them are fairly good at that point. So getting 1% better is really, really good. So I need to find another way of evaluating that. And therefore, after each generation is completed and new children are created, I had all of the AIs also play against random bots. So one AI against three random bots for 300 games. Using that, we can better estimate if one generation is better than another. And this is what the training results look like. The blue line shows the average win rate. So if we look at all the AIs and average how much they win against random bots per generation, we will get this line. The red line shows the worst one in each generation and the green line shows the best one in each generation. And what we can see is that the AI actually manages to win up to 62% of the time against three random bots which is really good. Only one thing to consider is that, yes, it's still 300 games only we're evaluating on. So this might not be the most accurate. Therefore, I made sure to save the best AI we could get and tried afterwards to evaluate it against three random bots for 10,000 games. And here we end on 58% instead, which with 10,000 games, I assume is fairly accurate. So now I had my strong Ludo player. And a part of the report was to try and evaluate it against another person in the class's AI. So I compared it with a friend of mine and expected to see extreme results. However, sadly did not perform super well against hers. Hers was significantly better, even though we had made close to the same method. So what was the reason for that? I don't know exactly, of course, but I suspect a few things. One of the things is that her neural network is significantly simpler. She does actually not even have a hidden layer. It goes directly from input to output, which means that it needed significantly less generations to get better because there were fewer, <laughs> there were fewer values in the chromosome that needed to be adjusted. The other thing is that she accounts for two things in her inputs that I simply forgot. One of them is to account for the difference between being safe in the home area and being safe in the end area, which of course you would use different strategies to deal with. Another one is the fact that if two pieces stack on top of each other, then they are also a safe area, which I completely forgot. <laughs> but still, given all of this, I felt like my AI performed good enough and was quite satisfied with the results. This definitely was an interesting project and I really want to work more in the future. And I also hope that you found interesting listening to this. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.